Let us set aside the anger and revulsion, disbelief, helplessness, and perhaps even fear that many of you would have felt over Sunday night's events at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And let us also postpone the question of who those masked thugs were who beat up students and faculty and destroyed public property on campus. We have a fairly good idea of who they were and who is protecting them, but more about that later. Instead, I want you to think about a more fundamental question. Regardless of where you work or study or live, are you safe? Do you feel safe? Do you trust the police to keep you safe? Do you trust the government to keep you safe? If your answer to all these questions is yes, I don't think you're telling the truth. But good luck to you anyway. As for the rest of you, the rest of us, we were disturbed by what happened to the kids at Jamia and Aligarh Muslim University when they protested the Citizenship Amendment Act last month and bore the full brunt of an out-of-control police force. And yet, many well-meaning people still felt a sense of disconnect, that this can't ever happen to me and mine. Well, after JNU, you need to be clear that this horror show could well be enacted in your neighborhood. Because if the heads of students can be cracked open over the course of more than three hours in the heart of India's capital, with the police standing by, despite the presence of the national and international media, then this can happen anywhere, anytime, and to anyone whom the masked thugs and their political masters decide to target next. A host of shocking incidents over the past five and a half years have left us in no doubt about where India is headed. But the importance of what happened at JNU is that it marks a point of no return. The Modi government has made it clear it will not be deterred from its project of suppressing the democratic rights of the people and ensuring there is no effective opposition from any political, social or institutional quarter. When you allow thugs to do what they did in full public view to students of India's top university, you are basically telling the country you don't care about the political or legal consequences. Now, what kind of a regime can be so indifferent towards the consequences of what happens? One that has no intention of ever going away. Since 2014, the Modi government has systematically undermined one institution after the next. The list includes parliament and its committees and protocols, the judiciary, the RBI, the CBI and other investigative agencies, and the media, of course. The idea is to ensure the power vertical around Modi should face no countervailing power. In India, as around the world, universities have traditionally been an important source of resistance to rulers with undemocratic ambitions. Resistance typically comes in two forms the intellectual ideas and research produced at the university, and the strength of the student and teachers' organizations and unions. And if there is one university that typifies both forms of resistance in India, it is JNU. That is why, from the word go, the Modi government in its first term worked so hard to undermine the university on both fronts. They appointed a pliant vice-chancellor, Mamidala Jagadish Kumar, to tie down the faculty in bureaucratic rules and then undermine every department with highly questionable appointments. At the political level, the BJP and the central government, with the collusion of the Delhi police and the pliable media, launched an attack on the students. The first target were the activists back in 2016 who were framed on false charges. This is when the idiotic phrase, Tukde Tukde Gang, was introduced and its use industrialized across the right-wing corporate media. Next, the ambit was widened to tarnish the whole of the JNU student population as anti-national freeloaders. And then came the full-fledged assault on the right of poor students to even come to JNU by announcing a massive hike in hostel fees. Cutting across political lines, JNU students resisted the fee hike, but presumably, because of pressure from the RSS and BJP, 
the Akhil Bharatiya Vidyarthi Parishad, which is the student wing of the RSS, detached itself from the movement and started taking the side of the administration. Now, by linking Sunday's violence to the fee hike issue and the movement by students to oppose the registration process for the new semester, the JNU Vice Chancellor has helpfully connected the dots. The masked thugs who were allowed to attack the students protesting the fee hike appear to have been a last desperate throw of the dice by an administration and a government unwilling to admit defeat at the hands of students. Why do I say this? As an occasional visitor to the JNU campus, to visit friends who live there or to give a talk, I have always been stopped at the entrance and asked about the purpose of my visit. JNU is not a campus where anyone can simply walk in armed with lattes and rods without being challenged by the guards who are stationed at every entrance gate. This rule, which has been around for some time, has been more strictly enforced by the current VC. And ever since the mass of students have been protesting the plan to hike hostel fees, security has actually been on extra alert. So when the Ministry of Human Resources Development admits in a tweet that, quote, a group of masked people entered the JNU campus, threw stones, damaged property, and attacked students, unquote, the obvious question the ministry is sidestepping is how a group of masked people could enter the campus with weapons in the first place. To my mind, the goons could not have entered without the cooperation of JNU security. That's basic. Now, given the kind of regime the VC runs, it is unthinkable that the JNU security could have acted in this way without the VC's blessings. But the VC, who is a handmaiden of the Modi government and a person who has never hidden his bias towards the RSS, would not have allowed the goons to wreak mayhem without his political bosses egging him on and promising the deployment of stormtroopers to crack some skulls. Maharashtra Chief Minister Uddhav Thakare has compared what happened in JNU to 2611 in Mumbai. He may be right at one level because for several hours, the masked thugs were able to do pretty much what they pleased. But if we're looking for analogies, I'd say I was reminded of Delhi 1984 and Gujarat 2002, when the police stood by as innocent people were attacked and killed. Now, when does the police adopt such a lenient attitude towards hoodlums? Well, when they are politically connected to the ruling party and government. By now, there is enough evidence from WhatsApp, Instagram, eyewitness accounts, and even media interviews for there to be no doubt about the identity of the masked attackers as ABVP activists and supporters. Of course, already efforts are underway to ensure action is not taken against them. The Minister of State for Home Affairs, his ministry actually controls the Delhi police, has already declared that there is no way that anyone connected to the BJP could be involved in violence. And rather conveniently, a Hindutva outfit that no one has ever heard of has come forward to take responsibility. All of this suggests a wider political game plan run from the top to terrorize JNU into submission. Now, if you don't want to take my word for it, I have another foolproof formula for identifying guilt in such situations. Just ask yourself whether the police is making any effort to identify, arrest and punish the culprits. In Gujarat, Modi's guilt in 2002 was obvious when it took the intervention of the National Human Rights Commission and the Supreme Court for any of the riot cases to progress. At JNU, we are told the police has set up a probe. But since the police itself is being accused of collusion with the administration and the goons, I'm not holding my breath. It is not a coincidence that the first cases to be filed are actually all against the victims of the violence. If there is a silver lining to Sunday's incidents at JNU, it is this. More and more people across the country have realized that we have indeed reached a point of no return. They know Modi's shock and awe must not be allowed to prevail. The fact that this attack on JNU students has come at the same time as the government's plan to turn literally millions of Indians into doubtful citizens through the 
NPR, NRC, CAA process will further open the eyes of the people to what is actually going on. To the popular slogans of Kagaz Nahi Dikhayenge and Ham Dekhenge, the government stormtroopers have just added a third. Ham Sab GNU. We are all GNU now.